So welcome again to module two uh, of urban geography course, which is on geographic uh, perspectives and urban informality. The main learning outcomes uh, are threefold. Well, one is to understand what is urban informality. Second is how to study urban informality. And third, how to learn from and work with urban informality. Now these three are very broad and we'll develop this as we move on in the course. And as has already been explained, the course is in three parts. The first is introductory, then we will look at methodology and then we'll have discussions. Uh, the methodology and discussion part, we will tell you as we move forward how we take this. For now, the, the first part, which is introduction to informality, are two lectures. One is today and one is tomorrow. And uh, today's lecture is urban geography and urban informality. So basically, it deals with very large debates, large urban debates, and where does urban informality fit in it. And tomorrow's lecture focuses much more on urban informality. We so call it uh, introduction to urban informality. So it traces the development of informality as a concept from 1970s all the way till uh, late 2000s. Now, the first lecture, urban geography and urban informality, because it's going to trace very broad uh, urban debates, I, I would really prefer if you interact because it's going to be interactive. So if you don't mind, you can switch on your cameras and, and behave as if you are in presence in class, that you speak uh, as, as freely and not raise hands and, uh, and interact much more. Uh, closely because it, it's, I designed this course more as a debate than as a lecture. So when we talk about urban informality, the first thing uh, which we need to understand is what is urban. So that is gonna be the first part of this uh, presentation. And then the second part, we look at uh, what, what I call manufacturing of urban informality in the sense of how urban informality as a concept comes into being. And the third part is a little bit more practical uh, which is entering the urban informality debates and practices, which looks at how to read uh, articles, how to uh, engage with them. And it, it's quite interesting that all of you have read, so you have an experience of how to already read an academic article, but we give you a few tips which, which needs to be known. So the first part, what is urban? So when you say what is urban or what is a city, what is it that comes to your mind? This is where I would like you to switch on the mic and speak. Go to the next uh, slide, which is again a question. When you look at these two particular photographs, what is it uh, come to your mind? So when, when you speak or describe these photographs to someone, what would you say? What kind of urban does it represent or what kind of city do you think it would be? And please refer to the picture of the dog as the, the, the left picture and the picture of the goat as the right picture so that we know what picture you're talking about. I'll move to the, the next uh, discussion, which makes probably will uh, more discussion, are these two pictures. So when you look at these two pictures, and at the backdrop of uh, the first question which I asked as to what do you feel, what is urban or what is a city, what do these two pictures evoke or what, what does these, do, do these two pictures tell you about the kind of city these pictures were taken from? That you've noticed that there are buildings beyond the initial uh, cluster of, of what someone called a slum, there are taller buildings behind which looks very similar to the first picture. So let's uh, move on. And if you look at the, the, the first set of slides, which I showed you, the, the two pictures, on one side, it's a dog, and on the other side, uh, uh, it's the goats going through the, uh, on the footpath. And one of you described this orderly, disciplined, and undisciplined kind of a contrast. It is very interesting that at an abstract level, uh, it's an animal walking on a footpath, and the animal belongs to a certain human being, which is probably a resident of that city. While when the animal is dog, it is not at all shocking for us, but when the animal is goat, it creates a certain, it can be negative, positive, I'm, I'm not judging by the, the, the emotion, but it just does generate a certain sort of uh, differentness. And the same happens in the, in the second uh, picture where a lot of you commented that it's uh, the picture, the first picture is planned, it's the city center, it's where the infrastructure is, it's, it's where things are in order. And the second picture is the picture of lack. It's the picture where there is uh, no, oh, where there is poverty, where people don't have enough resources. Now, if you look at these two pictures, just to give you a background, the, the, the first picture is Melbourne, and the second picture is Mumbai. And the, the towers which you see in the first picture, it's, yeah, it's, you can call it the center of the city. These are uh, speculative investment, not all of them, but uh, many of these tall buildings in Melbourne are speculative investment, which basically means money from outside Australia has come to Australia, which has been parked, they have made buildings and no one occupies them. So it's empty building, very well kept, very well maintained. 
but it's it's a, it's an anticipation that someday there'll be a higher demand and they will get higher returns. So it's just a building without people. And on our, on the right side, you would have heard of Dharavi on one of the the mandatory readings uh, called Slumped Out Cities, rethinking suburban urbanism, where they, they talked about Dharavi and it's also made popular with the movie uh, Slumped Out Millionaire. So it is a picture of this particular slum, which is considered a very enterprising, a lot of businesses running there. So you see there is a difference between what it looks like and what goes behind the, the facade of, of, of the built environment. That does not mean that uh, living in Dharavi is very desirable. It, it, it does not mean that at all. I'll make this clearer as we move on, but for now, you have to remember two terms which we'll keep uh, coming back to in, uh, in the discussion today and tomorrow is the idea of metropolis and periphery. The metropolis is the, uh, the notion which is modern, which is desirable, which we consider as planned. While if you ask someone what is planned, it's a very difficult question. We don't know what is planned. But when we look at certain images, a certain city, a certain way of urbanity, if you may use the word, we call it modern and we call it planned, we call it desirable. These are the, the, the images which are clubbed under the category of metropolis. And the periphery is an anomaly. So the first picture becomes the desirable, nice plan infrastructure while I, I don't know you in most of the infrastructure is underground you cannot see what infrastructure goes there but it gives a feeling that yeah maybe these buildings you get water uh, supply 24 7 you you don't know but it you feel by looking at it so it's this politics of knowledge which i want to outline why do we feel that there will be infrastructure in the first picture and not in the second picture we will we'll keep coming back to this as we uh, move forward and one thing close to home uh, is a good example is uh, Florence. So Florence, uh, those of you who are here will know it. The river Arno flows and there are two parts to, to Florence, there are multiple parts to Florence, but one of the division is is on uh, where Duomo is, the part one, which is the Florence and part two is called Ultra Arno. Essentially it's the other side of Arno. So if you happen to live on the other side of Arno, you will still call it the other side of Arno. Because if you live on part two, the, the, the Duomo side, the part one side is your ultra, no, but you don't call it. So you see this othering of why, why the, the part two is the other side of Arno is because part one is more important. Part one is the metropolis and part two is the periphery. So when I say metropolis periphery, it's not necessarily a, an economic divide. It's, it's a relation of power. Now, let's when we talk about relation of power, let's move to the, the first uh, of the mandatory readings you had. It's by Ananya Roy, uh, titled Slumdog Cities, Rethinking Suburbs and Urbanism. I, from the chat, I, I guess that most of you have read this uh, uh, text. So what was the, the difference that she was making between mega cities and global cities? And where did poverty picture come into this distinction of mega cities and global cities? Did she associate poverty with slums? point because it's, it's not just uh, economic but it's also a, a certain life choices you have to make because you have to live closer to where you work and if housing is not available then you make do with the kind of housing which is available now going on uh, to to think about what is urban and what is an anomaly what is metropolis what is periphery all these things which are uh, quite diverse and contradictory to each other how do we see the urban or how do we construct the notion of urban one of the things which helps us doing this is what we call urban theory, which is a tool to read the urban. Now, to, to give you a, a very brief example, look at the grammar in a language. Now, you, to speak a language, you don't need to know grammar. So if you look at very young children, they speak language and they don't know anything about grammar. So why do you need grammar? You are, of course, taught in school the grammar of whichever language you studied, is that you, when you don't need, for example, the distinction between noun and verb to speak, why should we learn the distinction between noun and verb in any language? The, the idea is that you use this distinction to deconstruct the language, to understand the language at a much deeper level. So if the, the, the language, for if you look at uh, language, grammar is the theory of the language. Similarly, urban theory is what helps us in a very broad sense to investigate, which is basically a tool to study the urban, to understand, which is basically a lens to view the urban, and to discuss a language to communicate. Now, this does not mean that everyone needs to understand urban theory very well because you can might as well enjoy a city, live in a city all your life. But these are the urban theory is specifically devised to investigate, to understand, and to discuss. Now, to 
to to give you a broader picture and a picture beyond the metropolis what i will do is because we talked a lot about uh, uh, poverty and and positionality positionality would basically mean the example of of uh, what jennifer gave the example of the goat like the person who lives in a place where goats are always walking on the footpath maybe does not find it shocking and i will do this using three key examples one is the income distribution and the notion of urbanness and the second is urban knowledge production this is a very broad term so i will limit myself to just the academic understanding of urban knowledge production and third a majority urban world which uh, i think in the previous module we have already studied that we live in a in a century where uh, more than half of humanity is urban so let, let's let's look at these three key moments to understand the urban the first is uh, it's a map from the catalog uh, in of the architecture in Dale in Rotterdam in, of 2007 so of course the data would have changed it's uh, more than 10 years old but the percentage more or less remains the same so what they did is they, they constructed a map to show where there are international borders being created but one thing very interesting is is this two difference between the green part where 73 percent of the world income lies but only 14 percent of the world population and the rest of the world where 86 percent of the population live but only 27 percent of the world income goes so to understand this difference in the in, in 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 wealth which also wields a certain amount of uh, power both in the realm of knowledge as well as geopolitics now just having uh, this green portion uh, occupying 73 percent of the world income does that mean that this area is very rich for that we have to look at another map what this map does is that it takes a country and distributes its wealth equally amongst all its citizens so basically if you look at china 2x means if you take the entire wealth of china and give it equally to every chinese citizen an average chinese citizen will become two, two times richer so with this map you will see us and russia the old uh, rivals in the cold war you'll see it's one of the most or two of the most unequal in terms of wealth distribution countries in the world so if you distribute the entire russian wealth amongst the entire russian population an average person gets seven times richer so you can look at this map later and, and explore whichever parts of the world you come from and, and see the difference then there's another map very similar to this but it's at a global level what what it does is takes the entire wealth and distributes it equally amongst every human being on earth and see who gets richer so for example if you take the entire global work and divide it equally amongst everyone an average american is still twice as rich and an average russian is 19 times richer while an average chinese is three times richer so if you see the two contrast uh, between the income in, uh, wealth inequality within a country and global wealth inequality because you can see some of the central african countries was 185 times richer so you see the distinction so this global difference in income distribution both as regional differences as well as inequality within a country needs to be understood so when we will say us is a rich country yes in a global realm but there is a lot of inequality within the country as well same goes for italy same goes for everything so we have to understand this this ill difference when we talk about poverty let's move to the second one which is the urban knowledge production now before i move up where i took the data is this particular uh, link which is called web of knowledge it will be interesting also for you to go there and if you are looking for uh, uh, academic papers or articles written on a certain topic you will it will be helpful even for your thesis and i don't think you will be able to access it outside the university wi-fi so you need to be either in university or you just need a vpn now what i did is i searched the term urban theory in in quotes which basically means any article which had urban theory in totality in the title or in the keywords or in the abstract and i looked at the output language in the sense in what language is urban theory written so you will see there is like it's without a doubt there is a domination of english language articles and then comes spanish but if you, if you look spanish is also much more widely spoken and then it reduces uh, all the way and all of them are if you consider uh, all of them are european language well most of the english uh, language uh, academic outputs are also produced in the united states so you see there is a difference when we when we conceptualize what is urban or what is a city there is a big bias from the anglophone world because the anglophone understanding translates directly into urban theory translate directly into how we investigate how we understand and how we discuss the urban and the city now if you look at the output country the countries from which it comes from the orange each are the countries which was in the green area of the first map i showed you the, the richer part of the world and the red which are only four countries from 
which are outside that green zone. So you see the most of the urban theory is produced from a very specific geographical location in a very specific linguistic context. So it's, it's, uh, uh, this is where I was uh, uh, asking uh, when someone from your class said that we see a lot of movies of income inequality in India, but we don't see that many income inequality in, for example, Sri Lanka. Why is this interest in India and not in Sri Lanka, which, is, which are close to each other? It comes from where the knowledge is produced and how the knowledge is produced and which language the knowledge is produced. Moving on. Okay, this is the map I was referring to. The third uh, instance which I wanted to discuss was this majority urban world, which you would have heard, I'm sure you heard it in the first module, and I am pretty sure you would have heard before also. This is the 2001, uh, uh, the preface to the, uh, the UN Habitat 2001 uh, report by Kofi Annan said, the world has entered an urban millennium. Nearly half the world's people now live in, are now are city dwellers. Now it's very important to deconstruct what this majority urban world means. Now, how does uh, UN get this data is that it takes the data from different countries, different con member countries give the data to, to UN saying that, okay, we have this much urban and UN compiles it. And this compilation started somewhere around 1960s uh, when, you, when UN started taking data from different countries and putting them together to get a world picture. Now, if you look at this particular graph, it's two part graph, the first part, if you look at Europe, Oceania, Latin America and Caribbean, North America, all of them were more than 50% urban by 1960s when UN started collecting data. So it's 1960s, it's uh, half a century ago, they were more than 50% urban. So when you say we are turning more than, like the humanity is urban, what it actually means is the anticipated, not even feel, the anticipated urbanization or the anticipated move beyond the 50% of people moving to urban areas in Asia and Africa. So when, when you, next time when you hear the world that we are more than half urban, you should keep these statistics in mind that it's only two continents which is singled out when it comes to uh, the majority urban question. The second thing about this, what it does is, is that when we say we are more than 50% urban and four major continents were already 50% urban, it creates a distinction between the urban and the other urban. And this is the same which I wanted to discuss with the picture of, of the goat and the dog, a picture of Melbourne and Mumbai, is that there is an urban, a notion of urban which is real urban, and there is the other urban which is catching up and some point in future will become the real urban. And the other urban goes by different terms, suburban urbanism, informal urbanism, say X, Y, Z, because you will come across multiple of these terms. Now, another problem with this majority urban world uh, understanding is the definition of urban. So what does urban, what does urban mean? As I've told in the beginning, the countries, different member countries of the UN give their data to UN and UN compiles. But all these countries have very different definition of of uh, what it means to, to urban. So I took uh, from this particular paper on all the presentation, just to point out at the bottom is I always mention the, is where I mention the reference. So when you go back, you can look at what references are there and check for yourself. So I just simplified uh, uh, the, the data based on country, population density and other parameters to look at what, what does urban mean in different countries. So if you look at Australia, it's just about population. So a settlement more than 1000 population can be classified as urban. US, it goes to 2,500. UK, it goes to 10,000. While Germany, it moves to density. While Canada, it has to have a minimum set of population and a minimum set of density. Botswana, it needs to have a minimum set of population, but also economic activities. And in China, it needs to have a minimum density, but it also needs to be declared urban. And this is true for many countries, not only China, even in India, it has, there are many cities which are still considered villages. So there's a whole history of census towns that which are not urban because the government has not declared it as urban for multiple reasons. And then you see, for example, in Japan, the population needs to be more than 50,000, while in Australia, it's just 1,000. So you see the difference between these two, two countries. So what it means to be urban is very different in different countries. And this is the data which gets compiled at a global level. It's very important to do that global compilation. So my critique does not mean that we should stop doing this, but we should understand that when we do very broad contours, there are some issues and those issues need to be understood very clearly. Now, coming back to the question of what is urban, do you have any comments on, on what is urban now? Again, we quickly summarize uh, what we have talked in now, that the urban is subjective, that it depends on from where you are viewing and who is viewing and who is conceptualizing it. It is context specific. So even if you 
take the definition of an urban, it's different in different countries. And why is it different in different countries? Is because the idea of urban is politically constructed. So it is subjective, context specific, and politically constructed. Now, if we go to the other uh, mandatory reading, Planet of Slums by, by Mike Davis, how did Davis picturize the urbanization progress in the world? Concerns and, and, and uh, where did he say that most of the people, or where is the urbanization happening? Where is the growth happening? Now it's your turn to speak. <laughs> For example, did you encounter the term urbanization without growth? At the very beginning of the chapter. So, uh, we will come back to these mandatory discussions, uh, mandatory readings again tomorrow. So please go through it once more in, in, in more detail. And one of the things which will help you is there is a general agreed understanding. When I say agreed understanding, a general agreed understanding in academia, in universities, the distinction between the three terms, city, urban, and urbanization. This is not a, a definition, it's a general understanding which will help you read the articles uh, when you go through them. A city is a geographically or politically defined area. It's an administrative category. So when you say city of Florence, there is no doubt. There is a clear boundary. You can go on the ground and say, okay, city of Florence ends here and city of Florence, uh, like some other city starts on the other side of the road. That does not mean the person living on the other side believes that he or she does not live in Florence, but there is a very clear boundary. Urban, on the other hand, is a concept which we discussed, which is very varying and, and quite contradictory at times. And urbanization is the process of becoming urban. So these three terms, city, urban, and urbanization, are three different terms, which means generally three different things. So when you read the, the, the mandatory readings and later when you read the, uh, the papers for discussion, make sure you, you see these uh, differences because it won't be mentioned in the paper again because it's, it's kind of generally understood. Now, if urban is subjective, context-specific, and politically constructed, and then how do we define or understand urban informality? Now, this you really will have to help me <laughs> deconstruct. I, I, I took this image. One is uh, Ponte Vecchio from, from Florence, those who are from here will, will know it, uh, of course. And the other is uh, a settlement, again, in, in, in Mumbai next to the train tracks, which I found morphogenically uh, has the same massing. So I put them together. To, to ask a question, then what defines urban informality? Because the, the extensions on Ponte Vecchio were also made uh, much later. So it's an urban infrastructure, a bridge to which additions were made. And the same way on the right side, the picture from Mumbai, it's a railway track, it's an urban infrastructure to which people occupied and additions were made. Of course, economically, two different things. What is being sold in Ponte Vecchio, I don't think uh, many of us could afford, while uh, it's quite affordable housing of the picture of, uh, uh, of the settlement in Mumbai. Do you see any similarities or differences between these two pictures? We can discuss this later also. But in terms of economy, again, coming back to the mandatory reading, if you look, would this, the movie Slumdog Millionaire, would, would it have made that much money if it was, uh, if the story was created in the backdrop of Muntevik as opposed to Dharavi? Like, what is it that led the movie to win Oscars and get money? Like, so much money, actually. But keep this in mind, we will uh, keep coming back to this question of, of uh, how these two settlements, if you may, or how these two pictures uh, in a broader sense are different. So if urban is subjective, context specific and politically constructed, for now, let's also begin by saying that urban informality by default is also subjective, context specific and politically constructed. Now, what I will do is the, the next part of the, the presentation, I will go through very briefly in the general idea of urban informality, how it was constructed and the very large contours. This is the part which we take in much more detail uh, in tomorrow's class. So I, I would suggest that you look at this as a, as a very broad introduction. And before coming for tomorrow's class, please, please, if you have read, go back and read again through the, uh, the mandatory readings. It's very important that you go through the mandatory readings to be able to discuss um, in tomorrow's class. So how I intend to structure this is basically three key moments or, or three key uh, terms, if you may, of uh, how uh, urban informality discussions started and changed. So the first, I will talk about urban informality in terms of economy. The second shift urban informality in terms of beyond economy. 
and both economy and beyond economy are quite tangible. And the third one, we move to more intangible, beyond tangible. So the first economic discussions, they start with the term informal sector. So in the 1970s, uh, there was a, a ILO report which studied Ghana and then they realized that actually there's a lot of economic activities going on, but it does not reflect in the, the economy of the country when you calculate. So the, the, the usual economic models does not apply because a large part of people do their economic activities outside the realm of being formal. That means they don't use banks, their businesses are not registered. So all these economic activities is, escapes the calculation. So when you calculate, what you do is you, you take the bank data, you take the how many businesses are registered, how many people are getting salary. So when you do that, a lot of people who don't get salary, who don't register their businesses are left out. So this term was invented, if you may. It's called informal sector, which basically means a sector which is outside the realm of government registers. So you need a different kind of methods. You cannot just go to banks and collect their financial data to understand how this economy is working. So this particular uh, term or concept was uh, invented to understand the, the economy, though, which was also beyond the formal economy. And because these forms of economic activities were carried out by people who could not access formal finance. So basically, if you go to the bank, you don't have a house, so they did not give you a loan. You went to your friend, got some money and started a business without registering it. So basically, it means you are vulnerable. You did not have the enough resources to take part in the formal economy. So this also led to a, a, a kind of a study of the labor. So that's why it's also, if, if you look at the interest, it's, it's first uh, report was by International Labor Organization. So it was uh, the labor rights, the exploitation, all these debates were part of this economic uh, discussions. Now, because it was looking at labor and the economy, so basically, of course, poverty came into picture. The things which got highlighted or the topics which got more studied were the education levels. Were the labor enough educated or is it because of lack of education they were shifted to the informal sector? What was the kind of employment status of the people who were working in informal sector? What was the migration status? As one of your classmates already mentioned that uh, people living in slums may be migrating from or displaced voluntarily or involuntarily from another place. And the whole discourse started as poor as victim of the economic model. So the economic model does not allow if you don't have enough resources to take part. That's why you end up in the informal sector. So the, the people who are poor us are mostly seen as the victims of the economic model. Now we'll get into the details of it, but for now let's move on. What happened in the in the move to beyond the economy is that when scholars started looking at informal sector, they realized that there is no informal sector as such which is independent. Because if a person is not registered, a business is not registered, setting up a business to do some sort of vending on the street, for example, the items which are being sold, many of them are produced in a very formal economic setting. So if you look at, for example, within Florence next to uh, Santa Maria Novella station, there are a lot of people who sell cell phone chargers or covers. These are made in China. Now, the made in China item coming to Italy, it's not smuggled. It comes through a lot of economic activities which are registered, there are trade agreements. So it's, the item in itself is very formal. So this shift happened because uh, scholars realized that informal economy cannot be studied in isolation. It's not like there is a formal economy and there is an informal economy. There are a lot of linkages and one cannot be studied without the other. So this shift happened and uh, you started looking at more informal linkages beyond economics. You started look, looking at more uh, global interlinked economic activities. So a person selling a phone charger in the center of Florence is a phone charger produced in China. So it has come somewhere, it's produced somewhere else, probably formally, probably informally. How does it manage the international copyright law? So it's, it's a bit large, it became a large gamut of things. And because it became so large, your immediate context changed because those who were looking at urban informality were not much interested in looking at how copyright laws, international copyright laws work in China or, or how do they trade uh, between uh, China and Italy, for example. So the focus shifted to housing type. Okay, so these are the people who are selling on the street. Where do they live? Do they have enough money to live? Do they live in slums or do they have a formal house but informally large number of people living in a, in a formal house? So these kind of marginality, housing type got enmeshed in the informality discussion and research on urban informality. Now, you, you, you read the UN Habitat uh, issue paper on, on, on urban informality. What was the conceptual difference between, say, informal settlement and the slums in this particular uh, report, if you may? You can uh, unmute yourself and, and speak. 
did you see how urban informality was pictured in the issue paper on informal settlements? So when when you go back and uh, read the or read again the the you you inhabit that uh, issue paper on informal settlements, look at how the slums have been conceptualized and look at how they have put slums and informal settlements in the same category or different category or what distinctions do they make and specifically look at uh, the notion of deprivations, which is basically the, the notion of lack and you have to read it. Uh, by understanding the position of UN Habitat. So when UN Habitat writes an issue paper, it is not just to write and give it to people. It envisages a certain action. So that's why the, the notion of lack or notion of deprivation becomes important because for you to act, you need to find out what is lacking. Okay, I need to do something in the class. Uh, okay, there are not enough screens, so I will put screens, for example. So like that, the urban, you have to problematize and problematize in a manner that they can act. So when you read the issue paper, look at the deprivations and actions needed or suggested in this particular issue paper. Now, moving on, the third aspect of beyond the tangible, what happened over a period of time when we started to read more and investigate more and, and research more on informality, we realized that there is a sort of governance tool as well. So if you look at, uh, since we are in Italy, let's look at uh, Italy. We have sort of the best, the government runs one of the best trains in the world, the fast trains I'm talking about. They're very spacious, very reliable, very cost intensive. Like you have to, you know, you need a lot of capital to, to make that infrastructure and to run it. While at the same time, there are slums in the south of Italy, which can be or informal housing, inadequate housing in the south of Italy, which can be cured or taken care of with a fraction of money of one of these trains. So why is it that the government is, running a train for very few people where the tickets are very expensive those who are, who are here will know it's very convenient but tickets are expensive so only a, a few section of the population gets to use them while if you use that infrastructure the money spent on that infrastructure to to have better housing for someone in the south of italy it would help a lot of people so wh why does the government make these choices and it's not just Italy. it's you will see everywhere even in in, in so-called poorer countries we, we took the examples of multiple countries uh, uh, India was the case because uh, one of the leading streams of India, or even if you look uh, at uh, Bangladesh, and, and it's not contemporary. It's It's been there for quite some time. So if you look at the Bangladesh, if I'm not mistaken, 1971 or 72, it got independence. And to construct uh, the parliament, it invited uh, the architect Louis Kahn, which was a celebrity ar architect in the United States. So if you consider Bangladesh as a poor country, a slum, Dhaka, too much population, it invited a star architect which many could not afford to build a parliament. And if you could build such an expensive parliament, and it's fascinating, huh? it's money well spent, why can't they take care of the slums? So it's it's complicated and you can also scale down, even if you look at rich country like Switzerland, where it, the streets are immaculately clean. If you go to a public toilet, it stinks. So a state which can keep clean, why can't it keep the public toilet clean? So it's, then when researchers started asking these questions, they realized that informality is not just about poverty and money, it is also a governance tool. So it has, a, there is a lot of politics, both in terms of realm of knowledge and also in the, in, in the realm of governance, which exists. And this is what led to the discussion on informality beyond the tangible means of oh, whether you have education or not, whether you live in a slum or not, or whether you have uh, water, access to water or not. And the focus, there were multiple focus, but two of the main focus uh, which fell on was one, one was the state brutalization and marginalization, where the discourse was essentially that the state acts in a manner that certain section of that society becomes marginalized or becomes poor. And when you are poor, you don't have access to many of the state's uh, facilities. So like I said in the, the, the train example, it's a, it's a magnificent uh, infrastructure, but you have access to that infrastructure only if you are a certain income group, because then only you can spend that much money. And this marginalization is negotiated and, and, sub, and subverted. So it's not a fixed identity. So essentially, to, if, if I have to summarize, Informality is not a fixed category. It's first of all, politically constructed. It's negotiable. So what is informality this year may not be informality five years down the line. Like uh, you said about Ponte Vecchio, it's historically valuable. And it is interest led in the sense whose interest lies where is very important to defining what is informality and studying something as informality. So for example, if you look at Airbnb or uh, uh, these uh, Uber Eats, uh, 
the employment is it's very informal, but if you look at the academic output or research generated out of it, it always falls on the category of gig economy, platform economy, gig urbanism. It is never called informal urbanism. So there is a certain sort of interest which defines what is informal and it is negotiable. It is not a fixed identity. Now, this may look a little confusing and I would agree, but we will discuss it in much more detail and with much more concrete example tomorrow. Now, the last part of it, if, if this is what urban informality is and urban is all complex notions, how do we understand or how do we engage with urban informality? In my understanding, there are two, two ways. One is to engage with the literature and one is to engage with the urban. To engage with the urban, we will discuss much more in detail uh, in the methodology section of the course. To engage with the literature, you already have the mandatory reading. And in the third part of the course, we will discuss a certain paper and it will be a, a seminar module. Now, this section is basically to make you understand how to read an academic article. If that is the one key you want to take. Now, there are multiple forms of written articles. Even in the mandatory reading, there is a book chapter, there is a, a report, and then there is an academic article which you have. So if you look at reports and academic article, there is a, a very key uh, distinction between the two. It, the report is written for a much wider audience. So if you open any report, even this is a UN report, look at that nice graphic which is there. You don't need to read, you look at the graphic, you see, okay, there are four board points, four main points. Read what it is, you get an understanding because it's written for a larger audience. While an academic article is written by academics for other academics. So imagine an academic article like conversation. So if me and, for example, Professor Loda here are talking and you come in between our talk, it's very difficult for you to understand what they are talking. And it's, it's the same if you are talking to your friend and I come in the middle of a conversation. So that's why academic articles are of a peculiar nature, nature because it is talking, it is a piece of conversation between academics. But it's also the key source of knowledge production, which we need to engage with to understand urban informality or city for that matter. Now, just, now, how do we read an academic article? Now, there are multiple formats in, in which academic articles or journal articles come out. But this is the basic structure, which again, is not a fixed category, it keeps moving. So first there is abstract, which is a, a very, like if you look at the, the article by, by Ananya, the, uh, the slumdog cities, there is an abstract which is small, usually 150 to 200 words you can read, which tells you a brief of the entire article or what this article is about. Then there is introduction, which introduces you to the topic of what this article presents. And then there is literature review and theoretical discussion, which basically discusses the literature. Basically, the idea of this section is to say that these are the articles or these are the academics I am discussing with. So, it, it puts a, a literature review and then there is empirical section where the article will tell you, okay, this is the, the empirics which I have studied. This is the method I have used and this is what I have studied and this is the data I have and this is how I interpret it. So that there is a discussion part and then the conclusion part where generally, oh, okay, I have introduced this. This is the literature I have talked to. This is the empirical section or empirics or data I have made and this is the discussion and why is it relevant in a larger a discourse of this particular topic and there are references the references are the final list of documents which were referred in the in the document now how do we read it is that i said there are multiple ways to read an academic article but i suggest one of the means which i found very effective is to read it twice so the first phase or the first reading you read the abstract very carefully you read the introduction very carefully and then read the titles of all the sections, even if you don't read the full section, the text of the section, but read the titles of the section and then read the conclusion. So this will give you a larger picture of what this article is about. Again, I'm emphasizing an academic article is a discussion between two academics. So there are some things you might not understand, ignore it, just, just read it. The important thing is you read it. After the fourth article, you will start understanding because you have to get into the loop of the discussion. In the phase two, you read from abstract to references in a linear fashion and read everything in detail. So if, if there are something that you don't understand, still continue reading, don't, don't stop there. And as and when you read, annotate, write things, highlight things which you find that interesting, write down things which, you, which reminds you of something else or something which you do not agree with. Try to make diagrams, annotate. All these things which you do on the paper are very personal. So that's why I did not put it in the, in the, in the presentation. When you write, just write, it's, it's my personal thing. I, so don't feel that some, no, anyone is going to judge. And write, ah, what is this? I don't understand. But this process is important to understand or go through the reading. And finally, when you have read it, summarize it in your own. Make a, a, take a usually I find it very helpful doing it by hand, but you may find it uh, helpful in doing it in the computer also, is to make a, a diagram 
and then just to summarize it for yourself it is not for for uh, for someone else it's for you that you know one month later when you have oh that article said something i should look back you go back and look at the diagram but it also helps you conceptualize your thought and formalize it so i will leave you at that and hopefully uh, we'll have uh, much more discussions in the in tomorrow's class and and even if you have read the mandatory readings please go through them once more so with with the topics discussed today now if you have some questions you can ask her. Thank you.